Hello and welcome to Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. I'm Tony Wrighton. Walking around in central London on an unseasonably cold September day. Summer's just fallen off a cliff. Uh, Now, yeah, today's podcast is about biohacking. And when I use the word biohacking, it's often an opportunity for my mates to take the mickey out of me, which is fine. You know, it's quite easy to take the mickey out of me for various things, and biohacking is just one of them. Um, I think a lot of them wonder, what is biohacking? And a lot of people in general kind of say, what is biohacking? And you could probably kind of search the internet for plenty of fairly fancy descriptions. But let me try with one of my own. I would say biohacking is tweaking your diet and lifestyle to kind of be the best version of yourself and feel good. How's that for a version of biohacking? Probably not technical, probably won't find it in a dictionary, but I don't think it's bad at all. And I've had quite a lot of success with biohacking, actually, um, from the kind of from the big to the small I mean obviously if you listen to this podcast regularly you'll probably know that I had some health problems a few years ago got a a virus in in the jungle and had to have a few months off work and I think it was in no small part down to biohacking that I helped myself get better and within that there's kind of loads of little tweaks that I made for example I found out through being a bit of a geek and tracking stuff that I was um just not exactly allergic but intolerant to cashew nuts for example and gluten so I just cut them out and felt a bit better and there's been loads of stuff like that that's kind of helped me to feel good and perform at my best more recently I've been trying something a little bit more major and this definitely my mates do take me the mickey out of and probably rightfully so um, I've been using the keto diet and if that's something you're interested in I am speaking to probably the world's biggest expert in ketosis in the next couple of weeks on Zestology so I hope, hope you'll listen to that one um, so yeah from the macro to the micro in terms of biohacking it's quite a lot of fun it's essentially kind of quite an enjoyable hobby which I do think helps me to kind of live and perform at my best as well and I know that a lot of people have a lot of questions about biohacking and that is why today's guest is on Zestology Ryan Munsey and I have an absolute biohacking geek out and he's a good person to ask about it used to be a model now he's a coach he's on various kind of councils and boards and advisory committees and he knows what he's doing when it comes to health and well-being and um, sorting himself out physically and mentally. So, you can take the mickey out of me for my biohacking all you like, but I'm going to geek out about it anyway. We're recording now, so Ryan, how are you? I'm doing well. Tony, thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to this. Yeah, I've been looking forward to chatting to you. So, look, straight away I want to ask you about men's fitness. Okay. You've, you are one of the top fitness coaches in the world and you featured on the front cover of Men's Fitness. You've got an interesting backstory, haven't you? I do. So one thing for clarification, I uh, I was not on the cover of Men's Fitness. I was uh, on the advisory board uh, when I did a, it wrote the, the complete workout program that was in uh, that, uh, that month's issue. Right. Uh, they actually, they actually decided to put Mark Wahlberg on the cover because he's apparently either better looking well, or more, more famous than I am. Yeah. Well, their loss, that's all I can say. <laughs> I'm looking at that cover now. So you wrote the, the lose your gut program on the yes. most fit. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you yourself were, you were a model for a while, weren't you? Like a kind of fitness, a body I model. I was, uh, when I was in, so I grew up, I, I played soccer or as your listeners would call it football, uh, and basketball my whole life. Um, when I got to college, I was not good enough to play at Clemson. Uh, Clemson has one of the best athletic departments and athletic programs, you know, here in the States. Um, and I filled that competitive void with lifting weights. Um, you know, any athlete who kind of hangs up the, the cleats, you, you miss the locker room, you miss the competition. And for me, it, it was the weight room. Uh, I became obsessed with, uh, the fact that we could manipulate the way we felt in terms of energy, the way our body looked in its outward appearance, uh, by the things that we ate, the way that we trained, and and for me that was uh, that's how I kind of got my start in you know what is now called biohacking. I mean, it didn't have a word back then, but um, 
you know, that's exactly what we were doing, you know, changing, you know, uh, the, the foods that we ate or, or the ways that we trained and, you know, building muscle mass or, or increasing sprint speed, anything like that. So, um, you know, from there, I got into bodybuilding. Uh, I, I'm rather tall and lanky. So, you know, somebody pulled me aside at, at the first show that I did and said, you know, you you have a face and a body that's more conducive to modeling as opposed to bodybuilding. Uh, and just to give you an idea, I mean, I'm about six one. Uh, most bodybuilders who win the professional shows are, you know, five six to five ten, and, right? and 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 they weigh somewhere around. Uh, well, there's there's two classes. There's open, and then there's under two hundred and twelve pounds. And the guys who are under two twelve are usually like really short, like five foot two to five foot six. Um, so for me to compete like with the professionals, I would have to be over 300 pounds in the off season and probably get on stage at around 260 to 280. Uh, that's a hundred pounds more than I weigh so now. When, so when was, Arnie, cause Arnie was a bodybuilding champion, right? He was, yeah, he was about six, three, six, four and probably competed at around 240, uh, somewhere in that range. So six, but if you, six foot three, six foot three. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you look at his frame compared to, you know, the professional bodybuilders of today, uh, you know, the, the bodybuilders today carry more muscle mass than, you know, that golden era, as it's called in bodybuilding, the, you know, the 60s, 70s, um, you know, where they had the tight waist. And, and now it's a different story. But uh, so so from there, bodybuilding became pursuing modeling. And in the year of uh, 2008, um, you know, I graduated from college and moved straight to New York. Uh, I didn't even stick around to walk the stage. I just said, I'm, I'm out of here. And um, uh, went up to New York and started trying to walk runways and uh, was fitness and fashion model. And, and that's where the personal training thing began. Um, you know, I, I was uh, quickly uh, approached by other models who saw me eating, you know, different than they did. And, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And uh, I, I learned then that, you know, my degree was in food science and human nutrition. So it, what seemed easy to me or, or you know, uh, common, most people have no idea how to feed themselves. You know, we know how to eat. We know how to go to the store and, and buy, you know, McDonald's or go to Chipotle and have a burrito, but we don't know how to feed ourselves. So, so you learned that. that at college? I did. That, did that's they teach what my, you, did my you, degree Did they teach you the right stuff? Because I feel food no. knowledge, yeah, food knowledge <laughs> changes so quickly. What they were telling us about margarine 15 years ago is very different to what they tell us now. Well, and that was that was a point of contention for me in, in college. And, you know, my degree is a dietetics degree. And had I pursued an internship after school, I could have become an RD, a registered dietitian. Uh, I chose not to do that, one, because I had what I thought was a better option to go be a model in New York City. Uh, and two, because the stuff that they were teaching us was not what I believed. It was high carbohydrate diet, you know, all the stuff that all the stuff that people like you and I on our podcast are fighting and, and trying to, you know, educate the, the masses that, you know, that is not the way. And uh, it's unfortunate that that's what's being taught, at least in American colleges. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that most of those programs are funded by, uh, you know, big food or, or government who is, you know, funded by lobbyists for big food. No so, way. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in the back of class and you know, when I'm, um, you know, when I wasn't in class, I was, I was fascinated by this. I mean, I'm, I'm a very curious person. Um, and I will deep dive down rabbit holes if, if I'm fascinated by something. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I started to realize that I could change my inputs and get different outputs. And, and for me, it was food and the way I trained and, you know, in college, when I wasn't in class, I was at home and I read there were there's some some websites like T Nation, Elite Fitness, uh, a lot of websites that are dedicated to, you know, men's fitness. And I mean, at the time I had a subscription to men's health, men's fitness. I read every one of those magazines every single month. I read every article on all those sites. I learned everything I could from all of the best strength coaches and, and kind of um, muscle nutritionists, if you will, as opposed to clinical nutritionists. Um, and you know, all the things that I was learning on there matched the things I was learning in the science courses that I took in school. So my, my, de my degree curriculum was split into science courses and then, you know, your, mm -hmm. your degree curriculum. So like all the sciences I, t I had to take 
you know, so every you've got like science. A perfect you biohackers background, really, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So I've, <laughs> I mean, in, in college, I had to take microbiology uh, and you know, food and dairy microbiology, and of, of course, chemistry, biology, organic chemistry, biochemistry, anatomy, physiology, all these things. So I'm learning, you know, how the body works. And then when I go to my nutrition classes, and they're saying, "Well, this is how you need to eat for this," and I'm like, "Well, wait a minute, that doesn't really match what I learned in you know metabolism class." Wow. And the things that I was reading on my own did match that. Yeah. So, you know, that's where I really became kind of disenchanted with, um, you know, the, 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 I guess the, uh, the orthodoxy, you know, right. Like the, the government and the, you know, the, the, my food pyramid and my plate and things like that. So here's an example. Um, one of the classes that we had to take, um, was called medical nutrition therapy, MNT. It was a two semester class. So there's MNT one, MNT two, and we learned how to build diets for certain, uh, medical conditions, you know, whether it's diabetes or celiac disease, anything like that. So that's, that we, we took, I mean, two semesters of that. Right. And, you know, we've already had all the science stuff. So the way we were taught in school, the average, uh, just for, for a healthy person, the diet that was recommended was 60% carbohydrate, 20% protein and 20% fat. Right. And this is the, mm. the standard 2000 calorie diet that you see on a nutrition label. Do they still uh, teach that now? Well, it's been a few years. I don't want to tell you guys exactly how old I am. Uh, no, I don't care. <laughs> it's um, so I, this I was in school from 2002 to 2008. Um, so I don't I don't I think the answer to your question is yes, they probably still teach it that way. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Um, academia will always have a lag time behind science. So the things that, that you and I and, and other people who are kind of pushing right. this, this wave, the, the science, the studies that we're reading are studies that are coming out now. And before that yeah. ever goes in a nutrition textbook or, or any kind of scientific textbook, it has to be peer reviewed and validated by further studies. And, you know, then it's like, well, can we get it past the lobbyist and, and is it going to get squashed by uh, you know, Monsanto or, or Kraft or, or General Mills. So when you think about medicine and nutrition, those two things, the, Act, yeah. the, what, what our doctors of the future are learning now is based on research from years ago. Well, and I wouldn't even limit that to health. I would, I would say all academia, like look at business, right? Like business in 2017 is so different from business in 2007, mm. right? I mean, with, with the advent of social media, I mean, there was no Instagram in 2007. Look yeah. at how Instagram and YouTube and Facebook have completely changed. There was Facebook in 2007, but there were no Facebook ads. Um, business has changed. But you it's like if you learn it. sports journalist, obviously that's my job in the UK. I work for Sky. Um, you have to learn shorthand. <laughs> so like basically this mm-hmm. is writing down what someone says in a series of squiggly uh, symbols. <laughs> you don't need. You can just get your iPhone out and press record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, that's that's my point. Academia will always uh, lag. Uh, you know uh, what what the current trends are, what the current research is, and and that's unfortunate. So I, I think the answer is probably yes. This is probably still okay. what's taught in school. Yeah. So so here was the thing. You know, we have uh, the and and first of all, I mean, you know this, and I'm sure you've had plenty of guests on your podcast so that your listeners even hear like if, if the average diet recommended was 60% carbs, 20% protein, 20% fat, you know, that's not the way you, you talk about eating. That's not the way you eat. That's not the way I eat. Uh, yeah. Um, and so that was for a healthy person, right? So what we learned for, for diabetics, and this was imp- incredibly important to me, this was, I really focused on uh, blood sugar metabolism, insulin, how it impacted body composition and overall health, because I'm the only male in my family who is not diabetic. And that was one of the things that really got me interested in all this because I didn't want to go down that route. And, you know, my high school basketball coach had a father who was diabetic and, you know, he had to have his foot amputated. And it's, that's just always been a a very, um, you know, sensitive area for me. So, we learn, you know, diabetics don't process carbohydrates normally. They, they have an issue with metabolizing them. Uh, when we eat carbohydrates, they're broken down into glucose. That's the usable form of energy. And if, if you don't process that correctly, guess how our curriculum told us to change the diet for a diabetic? 
What would you think? I mean, what, what makes sense to you? Oh, I, I have no idea, but I dread to think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, so here was the solution. Um, to reduce carbohydrate intake from 60% of total um, you know, dietary calories down to a whopping 50%. And then we were going to split the difference and go like 25% protein, 25% fat. So you have this population that does not handle carbohydrates, right? Mm. And we're going to say 50% of their diet is going to come from carbohydrates. Right. And it just, that just didn't, I, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't just... get behind that. And, and I was not going to go into a clinical setting and prescribe that. And, you know, if, if, so to me, you know, now I see this and, you know, my, my wife's a doctor and, you know, I'm, you know, I, I have an idea of what's going on in the medical world. And, uh, you know, again, every male in my family is diabetic. I've, I've helped a lot of people uh, through running the gym and, and through what I've done, you know, with nutrition coaching who have been diabetic. And, you know, the, the medical uh, kind of path is, you know, take this blood sugar medicine, this pill, use diet and exercise, and uh, you can keep eating carbohydrates. Well, especially for, for type two diabetics who, you know, they don't, they, they don't respond to insulin the way they mm. should. So, you know, you're still telling your body to, you know, have an insulin response if you're eating carbohydrates, it's gonna so, do that. So you, so you were working as a model in New York Mm-hmm. Um, and not, not of, a lot of models were talking about this stuff. No, so. <laughs> no, but it, but but all this knowledge helped you to get a super ripped bod. Yeah, it am did. I right in saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and why, I mean, why I, did you? I mean, why did you give that up? Because it sounds to me like quite a good life. Well, that's what I thought too. I, I thought it would be, um, and that's why I kind of joke like you know that was one of the reasons I did not become an RD after college. Um, you know, because I had this opportunity to go to New York and and basically get paid to lift weights and eat right and, you know, be <laughs> photographed with my yeah, shirt off. Yeah. Right? So who, who wouldn't want that? Um, but it turned out that, that the industry is not uh, what it seems. And um, it's a very uh, shady or dodgy, as, as you said on our show. Uh, is that because dodgy. everyone's taking steroids? Uh, no, I, I don't want to seem like, you know, somebody with sour grapes and, and trying to throw a bunch of people, you know, under the bus. But yeah. um, you know, there's, there's the saying about sleeping your way to the top. And, mm. you know, that is what had to happen in the modeling industry. And it was with people of your own gender. Um, and, you know, I basically was asked to do things that weren't in line with my values uh, in return for getting campaigns for big name brands. Right. And I just didn't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I didn't play the game. And I didn't get the jobs. And New York City is a very expensive city. Uh, so I, that again, like I said earlier, you know, that's where the personal training started because, you know, I wasn't getting the modeling work uh, yeah, that, yeah. you know, I hoped to get. So I ended up doing a lot of catering and a lot of personal training. And uh, I stayed up there for the whole year, 2008. And then I just said, you know, this is not how I want to spend my life. It's, it was very superficial. It was very self-serving and, you know, I wanted to focus on, uh, helping other people. Um, the idea was always to help other people, but I felt like if I could become a famous model, uh, that that would give me the platform that I wanted mm. or that I need to have people listen to me. Um, you know, if, if Cristiano Ronaldo says, you know, hey, this is what I eat and this is why, and he can back it up with science, a lot of people are going to listen. Um, so, you know, it, so, so um, I mean, what I'm interested in now is, you know, you have um, kind of established this practice where you're training other people to look great and obviously feel great as well. It's not just heavy lifting and nutrition you're obviously also quite into biohacking as well aren't you trying different things and i you know i was hoping to have a bit of a biohackers geek out with you um, yeah uh, what what are the kind of what are the kind of one or two or three hacks that you found have worked the the best for you whether it's you know when you were living in new york and you wanted to be as ripped as possible or whether you're working with kind of clients now what are those hacks either weird and wonderful all fairly straightforward because I feel when I normally ask that question people say well you got to get more sleep and you got to you know meditate yeah. and you got to eat more fat and they're all great but they but they're, but then when I say them to other people they're like yeah 
I was hoping you'd recommend a, a supplement made out of elk antler and something <laughs> else, you know. So, 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 so people want the exotic stuff, don't they? Yeah, they do. Uh, so, so here's something. Um, when I've never enjoyed cardio. And when I lived in New York, I didn't do any cardio. So I was a model and I was that lean and I didn't do cardio. Um, and I achieved that by eating the way I did. Um, you know, I, when I was there, I did something called carb cycling. Um, so I don't know how much detail you want to get into on that. But basically, my protein that I ate always stayed the same. Uh, I ate the same amount every day. Okay. And on a higher carb day, I would have significantly less fat. Uh, and then I would have a high carb day, a low carb day and a medium carb day. And I would sink my heart high carb days to hard workouts like a leg day. Uh, and then I would do like a low carb day the next day and I wouldn't lift and I would just be walking throughout the city. So I would right. get, you know, it's not, it's not cardio, but I'm walking. Yeah. Um, and you know, between that workout and walking, you know, I've, I've kind of gotten rid of all of that so glycogen, this is how which is we our can be sport. ripped like you and we don't have to do any cardio. If you do the lifting right. And it's, it's look, it's, it's 90% diet, right? Uh, at least if you're trying to accomplish it without doing cardio. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously food sources were, were always as clean as possible even back then. And this was one of the things I loved about being able to go to New York was I wanted, uh, you know, uh, grass fed beef and, you know, pasture raised eggs and all that stuff. And at the time, you know, very few people had heard of it. Um, but you know, in New York they had whole foods and they had other stores where you could get this stuff. So it was great to be able to eat, you know, the, the most perfect, uh, source of food. And then, you know, like I said, you know, in, in the right amount. And when I was up there, I was so detail oriented. I had spreadsheets. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when, when you were on, on yeah, our show. I've just been on your podcast. Yeah. I, I love a spreadsheet and you've been through your yeah. spreadsheet phase as well. Yeah. I, I, I was so, but again, like, and, and the way I think about this was, I mean, I was trying to get paid for the way I looked. So I had to be detail oriented. My body was, you know, my, uh, like that was how I made a living. So, you know, I wanted to know everything that I put in and every single amount I weighed, I measured, uh, you know, it all went into a spreadsheet. Um, you know, so I've been there. Um, I don't do that anymore because I'm no longer trying to get paid for the way I look. Um, but I, I definitely think that there's two things in there that, you know, that you could pull, uh, for, for listeners. I mean, one, it, you know, if, if it's important to you, measure it, track it. Uh, and, and two, you know, you don't necessarily have to do endless hours of cardio to get ripped. You can, you know, manipulate carbohydrate intake and fat intake to, uh, facilitate fat loss without having to do boring cardio that, you know, not everybody enjoys. So in terms of muscle, um, mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, you know, you, what you were talking about in terms of having more carbs on the day after a heavy workout. I've had a heavy workout, a weights workout today, and I got back before I interviewed you and I was absolutely starving. And there's a lot of carbs gone down today. And I think it's just because I was hungry, basically. But I don't have a particularly targeted approach to what I'm eating after I go to the gym. In general, though, is that a good idea to eat a lot of carbs? Because, you know, people you know, have, a, have a protein shake after going to the gym. But in general, is carbs good as well if you're trying to build muscle or tone? So everything is goal and context, context driven. Um, if the goal is to increase muscle size, then it's going to be really hard to do that on a low carb diet or on a no carb diet. Um, and one of the things that you know, we, we started to talk about this earlier with blood sugar and, you know, when you, when you ingest carbohydrates, mm -hmm. they're going to be broken down into uh, glucose and that's the usable form of carbohydrates. If your muscles have been, so, so we have two ways to get that blood uh, or that sugar out of our blood. Number one is insulin, and, and that's where like the whole diabetes talk came in. So we'll, we'll forget about insulin for now. The second way is something called non-insulin mediated glucose uptake. And that's a fancy way of saying that when your muscles have been moving, they're like a sponge and they will soak the, the sugar uh, up. They'll pull it out of the bloodstream and pull it into the muscles for use. Right. So if you think about like something that doesn't stop moving would be a hummingbird, right? And if you've ever had a hummingbird feeder, what do you put in it? Sugar water. 
um, if you think about kids and, you know, you, people think, oh, kids can get away with, you know, eating whatever they want because they have a faster metabolism. Part of that's true because, right, they're growing. But the other side of that is that they're constantly moving. You know, if you look at kids today and, and obesity rates versus kids 50 years ago and their obesity rates, you know, we have more obesity now. It's not because kids aren't growing as much. It's because kids aren't moving as much. So when you, the more you move, the more your muscles will pull carbohydrates into them and, okay. and, use, and use them, use those carbohydrates for energy, but also store them as glycogen. So yes, if, if you want to build muscle size um, and fuel later performance, so this was kind of how, um, you know, in endurance training, the whole carb loading thing came up, you know, and now we've got, we're seeing a shift in a different way. You know, if, if your readers or, or listeners are familiar with Mark Sisson and, uh, kind of becoming a fat adapted athlete, yeah. uh, I think that's better long-term for, uh, endurance if that's your goal. But in the eighties and nineties, we had this push towards, um, high carbohydrate intake for endurance athletes. Uh, and it was to fill glycogen stores. So that's why you would eat carbs the night before because they would be stored as glycogen and then you could use that for fuel the next day. But now, as we know in that application, you can only hold about three to 400 grams of carbohydrates in your glycogen stores. Now, let's call it 400 for easy math. There's four calories per gram. 400 times four is 1,600. So you've got about 1,600 calories worth of glycogen that you could store at the most. And so that's why, you know, in endurance sports that, you know, these power bars and goos and gels would come up because, you know, people would run out of glycogen, they'd bonk, they'd hit a wall. And then it's like, well, the body doesn't know how to tap into uh, stored body fat for fuel because it's on this sugar burning pathway. On the other side of that, if you're a fat adapted athlete, you know, we all have stored body fat. You know, even even like if you look at my pictures when I was modeling, I might have been at, you know, six, seven percent body fat. Um, you know, if I weigh again, let's so let's go easy math. If I'm uh, 200 pounds and I'm 10 percent body fat, that means I have 20 pounds of body fat. Right. So 20 pounds, there's how many grams in a pound? Uh, 454 grams in a pound. I don't know if that's all fat grams. But you can easily see how we are carrying thousands of calories worth of right. okay. stored yeah. worth of stored energy, and that's all fat is. Adipose tissue is is you know uh, from a time of surplus, in it's there for times of need. In, mm -hmm. in an evolutionary or ancestral approach to this, you know biologically, you know we're we're designed to store fat because we didn't always know when we were going to have our next meal. Yes. Uh, well, that, know, we that's a good point. Actually, I've been, I've been something I've been going through in my head. Do you intermittent fast, by the way? I do. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of weird. Like I'm an extremist on that. I actually eat one, maybe two meals a day. Oh right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, I do. And recently, I've been wondering about what takes me out of my fast state. Like, for instance, if I'm taking supplements last thing at night, is that because my body presumably requires a certain amount of energy to process a supplement? So, so it's something that's quite confused in my mind. I'm not quite sure if that's having an impact on uh, intermittent fasting, ketosis, whatever it might be. Right. I think it would depend on what the supplement is. So, so let's say if it's magnesium. Magnesium. For yeah. Human, like for yeah, example. I, yeah. I don't think that, no, like in my mind, that does not take you out of the fasting state. If you were taking five grams of branch chain amino acids, then maybe oh, right. it would. Yeah. What about, um, say, like a colostrum supplement or, I don't know, um, a Q10 supplement sweetened with stevia or something like that? So the, the stevia is, and, and here's the thing, like you want to make sure that, you know, if you're drinking a sweetened drink that it doesn't... Um, produce an insulin response. Mm. Uh, because basically the whole point of, well, not the whole point, but one of the key per benefits of fasting is that you don't have blood sugar elevation, you don't have an insulin response, and you're keeping insulin down. So it would defeat the purpose if we you know, consumed a tea or a coffee that had an insulinogenic uh, sweetener. Mm. Um, the, the, the CoQ10, I wouldn't worry about the, um, so the things that I would say would break the fast yeah. would, would either be something that 
is uh, ener- that contains energy. So if it's a protein, a fat, or a carbohydrate, or if it produces an insulin response. But fat in itself, I mean, you know, the theory behind bulletproof coffee is that it doesn't break you out of your intermittent, intermittent fast right. because you're only using MCT oil and butter. Right. So on the, I guess when I say fat, uh, so, so for me, like I kind of look at it as like an eating window, right? So if, whether you eat one or two or, or, or a window, like let's say you eat from 12 PM to yeah. 6 PM. Is that, is that what you do? Um, no, mine's more like one big meal at two to 4 PM. Uh, if I'm traveling or if mm. I've got things going on, I'll have a smaller meal somewhere around like one or two, and then I'll eat a bigger one around five or six. Wow. Uh, but most days if I'm at home, I just eat one meal, uh, at around two or three. So what do you have? Do you have a coffee in the morning? Some days I do. Some days I don't. Um, okay. if I do the bulletproof coffee, um, you know, that's, that's in the morning and it's, it's, it's either, I do, I use ghee. I don't do butter. Yeah, um, me too, actually. And yeah, yeah. because it, it, it's, uh, removing that dairy protein, um, and, um, uh, and MCT oil, uh, and eight, I use brain octane or, or any yeah. eight chain carbon, um, a C8 oil. So I don't consider that necessarily breaking the fast at that point. I mean, it's, you are consuming outside energy, um, and you are kind of using that. I would not, what, what I would say is on that back end, whatever time you stop eating for the day, you know, you wouldn't want to continue to consume food, um, or, yeah. or fats in that point. Um, but you're also in the morning, if you're just doing the, um, uh, the bulletproof coffee or butter coffee, anything like that, you're, you're limiting protein as well. So you, you know, I, I don't, to me, if I put protein in that, I know a lot of people will put protein in that drink. To mm. me, that that ends the fasting. I, I agree. I agree. Like a collagen protein is lovely in a bulletproof coffee. And, and actually, you know, for different reasons, sometimes I do that. But I know that I'm breaking my fast at that point. Right. But then I, right. but then I heard something recently that suggested even when you just have coffee, your body, it's not your intermittent fast, but your circadian fast is over. Now, I don't understand the difference between the two fasts. <laughs> well, I was thinking, yeah. that would be a shame, you know. I could, I could see that argument. I mean, the, the, you know, the circadian rhythm or the circadian fast is, you know, that's more about our biological clock and, and waking and sleeping as opposed to um, energy and, and metabolism. Um, so I could see that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that stop me from having – uh, coffee. I mean, I want to be awake. If you're awake and alert early in the day, you know, that kind of signals your body like, Hey, you know, you're getting that circadian rhythm mm. going. You're not, you know, delaying that. And I, I wouldn't want my circadian rhythm to quote unquote, wake up at noon if I'm trying to go to bed at a decent hour. Um, that's, that's an interesting point though. Mm. Um, and, and so I said some days I do uh, bulletproof coffee on other days that I don't, uh, I will actually have exogenous ketones. Okay. Uh, uh, so I am a fan of those. Um, even now, I'll do some versions of carb cycling, uh, and on the like that time, um, you know, coming off of carbohydrates or, or like now, I do fewer high carb days than I used to. Uh, you know, like when I was in New York, but um, I like the exogenous ketones as sort of a bridge to help decrease the amount of time it takes uh, to get into ketosis or to kind of become fat adapted so um you know to, to have that metabolic flexibility to bounce back and so, forth so what, what do you actually take in terms of that uh, i have used almost every brand um, that's on the market um the one that i have found the most success with is actually keto os the the keto operating system from prove it um, when how, I how do you started, know that your body's kind of operating more from a ketosis perspective when you take that? I measure it. Uh, I test my blood. Oh, so you I, are hardcore. It. That's that's proper biohacking, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Get the old so, testing out. <laughs> so so when I when I wanted to uh, to start experimenting with this, um, I, I it, it all happened actually last year for me at Paleo FX. Um, you know, I mentioned metabolic oh, flexibility. Are you going this year? Uh, I'm not because I'm actually going to be over there. I'm going to be in Sweden the same weekend speaking at the uh, Biohacker Summit in Stockholm. Are you? 
I am. Are you going to oh, go to that? Cool. Well, I would love to go to Paleo FX, but I think it might be a bit of a long way considering I've just had a month off. Um, yeah. And I'm not quite sure when this will go out, but you yeah, had a month off in January. But that conference, the bio, was that the one that was in Finland last year? Or yes. is it a different one? It's the same group of people. So uh, last year they did uh, they did one in May. Last yeah. year it was the week before Paleo Effects. It was in London. Right. Um, so, so my understanding from these guys is that there will be two a year. Uh, the first one, which is typically going to be around May, is yeah. going to be in a rotating city. Uh, I think there tr- there's some German guys trying to get it in Germany next year. Uh, and then I think I think in the fall it will always be in Finland. And um, what's it called? I'm writing this down. It's the Biohacker Summit. And it, they're they're a great group of guys. Biohacker Summit. Um, yeah, I think I yeah. know the guy. The guy who runs Timo. it has got a team. Timo. A uh, Timo Hapulto. Our, yeah. Uh, oh, right. The guy who invented the human tra- tracker. The human charger. I don't think so, but they were there. Okay, cool. I don't, yeah, I, yeah, they're they're great guys, and I've, they've been. Timo invented that. I didn't know. Um, yeah, they're they're really cool guys. So anyway, okay. I won't be at Paleo Effects this year because well, I'll be at the. At that, that sounds one. like a good excuse for me to go to Sweden. So maybe see. You there. I think yeah, come to Sweden. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But but no, so um, I, I ran into Dr. Mike Nelson, um, who uh, is a big proponent of, of what he calls metabolic flexibility. He's a great guy. He know, he's so intelligent, and you know we we started having this really cool kind of conversation slash debate slash just nerd geek out session at Paleo FX. and I said you know what I'm going to go home, and I want to start testing all these ketones. Uh, for me, it was. I wanted to see if they actually elevated my blood ketones. Mm. So I went out, I bought all the products, I bought a, a testing meter, and I just started testing my blood after tons of, I, I used them in the morning, I used them pre-workout, I used them in like every different application possible. And what I have found is that out of all the products, that this Keto OS is the one that elevates my blood uh, ketone levels the most. And it's also kind of the one that I enjoy taking the most and it, I, I have a kind of a moral issue with it because it is a multi-level marketing company. I don't particularly care for that, um, but at this moment it is uh, the, the best product that, that I've used, uh, so uh, I do continue to use it. And Multi-level uh, marketing company, that sounds um, uh, suspiciously, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so we'll just we'll leave it at that. And um, but it's a good so product. Like I said, and so that yeah, I guess that's the important thing. Yeah. So it does. It, and, it and you're feeling good on it, and you're and it's helping your kind of well being yeah. and your performance levels and everything else. Yeah. So here's one of the things. This and here's another kind of biohack. I guess um, probably. I don't. I, I guess this goes way back, all the way back when I was in college. I started doing this. Um, I started learning about the benefits of apple cider vinegar. It's great for regulating um, blood sugar, and it actually reduces the insulin response uh, from a carbohydrate meal, something like 10 or 20%. Right, so, so would, I, you, would you use it on food? I used to chug, uh, I would just uh, drink it. Take the bot- I would take the bottle, I would chug it, uh, about a tablespoon, um, and, and I would do that before my carbohydrate-containing meals. And so, so what that does is it means you process the carbohydrates, but you don't get a, a sugar spike from them. It makes your body more receptive to or more sensi- sensitive to insulin, so it takes less to accomplish the same job. Okay, it just doesn't taste very nice on its own, but that's fine. No, it. no, it doesn't. But um, Be- become comfortable so, with the uncomfortable. That's my mantra for twenty seventeen. Exactly, so that's exactly. fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I what I eventually I, then I learned that drinking warm water with lemon juice in the morning helped um, open up your digestive system. It helped produce bile, it helps you digest more fat. Um, you know, so those of us on a high fat diet, if we're not producing enough bile, then we're not getting uh, the absorption of that fat the way we want. So, you know, if, if that's you, if, um, you know, that could be an easy hack to add uh, lemon juice and warm water first thing in the morning. So eventually this became something that I did every single morning um, and I needed a name for it. So I started calling it my detox drink. And it, it was easier than saying, warm water, apple cider vinegar, lemon juice, Mm -hmm. cayenne pepper, and sea salt. But I would do a teaspoon of sea salt, a couple dashes of cayenne pepper, and a tablespoon of both apple cider vinegar. It has to be raw, organic, with the mother, and a tablespoon of lemon juice in a cup of warm water. And that would be the first thing that I drank every morning. I've been doing that since about 2010. And um, so I've always started my day by drinking a high 
that, that a teaspoon of salt, right? And one of the things that I found, I would always do that before I drank my bulletproof coffee. And one of the things that I found with the ketones, and, and most people aren't aware when you take an exogenous ketone product, that it, it contains anywhere from 0.9 to 1.6 grams of sodium per serving, depending on the product. So I've actually, uh, on days that I do the ketones, I don't do that detox drink, or if I do it, I don't add the salt. But I have noticed that when I wake up and I consume uh, water and sodium, uh, that it, it does help me feel awake. It you know remineralizes the body. Uh, some people have said that sodium first thing in the morning helps regulate blood pressure. Um, you know when when cortisol peaks, um, our adrenals in the morning have to kind of scavenge sodium uh, to to upregulate yeah. blood pressure. And if we take in that sodium, then we can uh, you know help our adrenals with their task and it kind of reduces adrenal fatigue. So that was one of the reasons that I started adding sodium to that morning drink. Mm. And so I have found that for me, my favorite application for exogenous ketones is to get out of bed and take them first thing in the morning because I get the salt, uh, I get the, the ketones and um, I actually take a caffeinated version. There's about 100 milligrams of caffeine in there. So I get sodium, ketones and caffeine and nice. I'm ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Well, um, Ryan, it's great to talk to you and have a bit of a geek out on the old biohacking. This, this yeah. summit sounds good in Sweden. Well, what's the subject of your presentation? Uh, that's still to be determined. TBC. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's so many ways that, that I can go with, uh, you know, what I talk about. That's, that's usually the hardest thing for me. I, uh, you know, I was, I was telling somebody yesterday, I, I wish I could just get up there and say, all right, throw your questions at me. But, mm. um, no, I, I will talk with uh, the, the folks putting it on and we'll come up with a strategy that is, um, you know, something that suits the direction that they want to go and, and what they most want, uh, you know, to be delivered to the audience. Um, you know, so far, our conversation has just been, you know, here's the dates, make sure you block these yeah. off safe and, and, uh, and we'll make it happen. So ah, sounds awesome. And um, yeah, let me know nearer the time. It'd be great to great mm -hmm. to meet in person. Um, yeah. What is one book that you'd recommend? And one we've already talked about books on your podcast. I've gone on yeah. your podcast. And we had a good we had a good chat on your podcast to me about all kinds of we things, did. natural testosterone sources and uh, NLP and everything else. But um, I've al you've already given me one book. You can repeat that book on this podcast or any other one. But what is one book that you'd recommend and one tip of all the things that you've learned over your years of uh, studying diet and nutrition and modeling in New York and now training um, so many people with your own practice? Um, one tip for living with energy and vitality. Okay. So the book that I mentioned to you on in my show was The Lost City of the Monkey God. Um, <laughs> I've made I, a note of that already. I, I love uh, historical accounts or it, this, is, this is an account uh, of, uh, of an eyewitness account of, you know, discovering uh, a lost archaeological site in the in a South American jungle. Um, I love books like that. Uh, I mm. love history. I love learning. I love learning about people who have done cool stuff. Um, so, so that was the book I mentioned on your show. I'm going to give listeners um, maybe two more. Can I, can I do two more? Yeah. Okay. You can rewrite so, all the rules. It's no problem. Okay. So on that thread of, you know, people who have accomplished a lot and done cool things, Jerry Weintraub is a fascinating human being. And, um, his book is called, if I stop talking, you'll know I'm dead. And, uh, the dude has done, uh, he, he lived an amazing life and, and did so much. Um, he was, uh, he became Elvis's manager. Uh, he was Led Zeppelin's manager. He's responsible for the, the Ocean's 11, 12, 13 uh, movies. Uh, Led Zeppelin manager. Um, just a, a fascinating guy. Self-made man. And um, that was a great book. Right. Uh, so another book that I read last year that I love is, um, you know, I love Navy SEAL culture. And the book is called Extreme Ownership. It's by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Um, I cannot recommend that book enough. I think, I think hands down, it's the best book on leadership ever. Um, and I would recommend that to, to anybody who wants to, uh, just become a better person or, you know, lead a better life. These are um, great so, recommendations. I'm, I'm loving this. And that, that, that book, okay. you, when I, it's actually called, when I stop talking, you'll know I'm dead. Useful I, stories from a persuasive man. There that you go. That looks great. 
Yes, there you go. Yeah, uh, I think I think personally, I think you will love that book. You you will love Jerry Weintraub. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Very so cool. then, yeah, and the tip. The one tip, man. I, I think th- this one may sound like it, it may not be actually you know like a I don't know I don't know if I like this as a tip or not, but I, but I think it's the thing that has served me is you know you you have to the analogy is touch the stove. Um, you know you can tell a kid. That, that the eye of the stove is hot, not to put your hand on it, uh, that it's going to burn you, but they won't know what that feels like until they actually do it. Mm. Um, I think I think we all have to, I've always seen myself and my body as, as a lab uh, for experimentation and, you know, very much the way I, I described, you know, the ketosis stuff. Uh, I think, you know, in, in today's age, we have so much information out there and it's a beautiful thing that we can educate ourselves and, and uh, find so many different opinions on, on so many uh, different topics. Um, I think don't be afraid to, you know, tweak any advice that you hear, make it work for you, find out, you know, you, you just, you have to experience this stuff. You have to do it. Um, and so, you know, touch the stove or, or you know, touch be your own laboratory. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. I don't, okay. Ryan, really appreciate it. It's been cracking to chat to you. Um, where can people find out more about what you do and the training programs that you put together and everything else? Yeah, so right now, uh, so I host the, the Optimal Performance Podcast. So every Thursday we're putting out a new episode. You can find that on iTunes, Optimal Performance Podcast. Um, everything I'm writing and everything that we're putting out now is under the Natural Stacks umbrella. All of our social media is at Natural Stacks, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, the website is naturalstacks.com. Um, if you want my personal stuff, it's at Ryan Muncy underscore on Instagram. Uh, and the website is ryanmuncy.com, although uh, there's not a lot of new stuff going on there right now. No, I've, I've, I've had a good look at your website and I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, Ryan, thank you so much. Appreciate it. I've, I've made loads of notes. I might have to listen back to a lot of this. Loads of notes <laughs> on the things that you've talked about. Um, but uh, and I'm going to read that book as well, which looks brilliant. It's, it's good to talk to you. Thanks, Ryan. Oh, Tony, it's been a blast. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks again to Ryan Munsey. And thank you for listening to Zestology. If you were to share this with one person, that would probably be the best thing you could do for me. So think of someone who might like a bit of biohacking. Think of someone who's not going to take the mickey out of you for it and pass it on to them. You can press the little kind of square button if you're listening on a podcast app and just share it with anyone through WhatsApp or Facebook or email or whatever you like. And I would really appreciate that. Uh, About ketosis, yeah. Now, this has been quite a journey for me this year. Um, I never thought that I'd really be interested in the ketosis diet, but I have been. And if you don't even know what ketosis is, we well, get a better get with the program because that is the most Googled diet of 2017, the ketosis diet. And I'm not even doing it to lose weight or to lose the old muffin top, but that's happened anyway. I'm doing it for other reasons, to kind of get sharp, Um, increase my energy levels because that's the whole point of this podcast and decrease inflammation as well so yeah ketosis is pretty cool and in the next couple of weeks I've got two of the world's biggest experts on ketosis coming on because that's been part of my journey so I wanted to make it part of this podcast as well so if you're interested and you'd like to lose the muffin top I'll see you next week and before then Remember to share this podcast. That really helped me out. Thanks. See ya.